Hi everyone here in the United States and around the world. Good news, we've broken through 235,000 subscribers and I look forward to seeing some of you at this coming weekend's Parapod Festival in Santa Clarita, California, north of Los Angeles on March 31st to April 1st. It's produced by Tony Sweet, owner of USBN Radio, and come join us to celebrate in Mentryville Park and the Hyatt Regency Valencia because of ever-increasing investigations of paranormal mysteries and UFO high strangeness. You can get tickets at parapodfestival.com. Also, the Parapod Festival is honoring me with the 2023 Media Legend Award, which I greatly appreciate. I have been trying to get to the whole truth behind the worldwide UFO UAP mysteries linked to animal mutilations, human abductions, and non-human intelligences since my first interviews with sheriffs and ranchers in September of 1979. That was 44 years ago. And since then, I have learned a lot from whistleblowers in military, aerospace, science, and medicine about other intelligent life in this Milky Way galaxy and the universe beyond. Facts kept from humans by both alien and human power brokers for centuries. But cracks in the centuries of lies are beginning to let in more light. Remember when I reported to you here on the Earth Files YouTube channel in January of 2022, 15 months ago, that one aerospace source told me he had been in classified meetings about plans to use the Webb telescope in April of 2023 to break the news to Earth that there is other biological life in the TRAPPIST-1 solar system 40 light years from Earth. Why is it called TRAPPIST-1? The red dwarf star was discovered in 1999 in the constellation Aquarius, but the seven Earth-sized planets were not seen until 2016 to 2017 by Chile's La Silla Observatory and its Transiting Planets and Planetesimals Small Telescope. Those words are the acronym TRAPPIST. And here is a headline this week on March 28, 2023, in Mashable Science, quote, Webb Telescope just started peering at the fascinating TRAPPIST planets. Would any of these worlds be suitable for life? Close quote. NASA itself started reporting about the seven-planet solar system back in 2018, comparing TRAPPIST to our beautiful blue planet Earth solar system. And then 15 months ago in January of 2022, I began to receive more details from an aerospace whistleblower with information that our government already knows there is intelligent life in the TRAPPIST-1 solar system. And my aerospace source says the TRAPPIST planet most likely to have, quote, high civilization, close quote, is the fourth planet out from the TRAPPIST sun designated as E1, an Earth-sized planet with a mixture of water and rock that my aerospace source says is very similar to our Earth. So I wonder why the public so far has been given Webb Telescope news this week only about the first very hot planet nearest the red dwarf sun, referred to as TRAPPIST-1b exoplanet. This first Webb survey news of the closest planet to the TRAPPIST-1 sun provoked Universe Today to headline, quote, Finally, JWST's data on the first TRAPPIST-1 planet. Survey says it sucks, close quote. Meaning the TRAPPIST planet closest to the red dwarf sun receives four times as much irradiation as the Earth receives from our sun. Plus, the dayside temperatures can reach 450 degrees Fahrenheit. But remember, 
This is the closest planet to that sun, like Mercury is the closest to our sun. Why didn't NASA start first by focusing on the large middle planets D and E that resemble Earth? That's where the aerospace source insists there is a, quote, high civil civilization, close quote. Further, I would like to share with you some excerpts from the aerospace source's actual communications with me a full year ago in January of 2022 about the remarkable TRAPPIST-1 solar system. Quote, I have it on sound authority that once the Webb telescope is up and running, there will be some sort of high civilization announcement. By July 2022, the Webb should be fully operational, and one of its priorities is to look at known exoplanets for biological signature signs of life in both the electromagnetic spectrum and the atmospheric systems. There is also an array of very classified instruments on board the Webb telescope in order to accomplish factual identification of a high-level civilization species by looking for artificial light, gases, and any type of electromagnetic signals that would be artificially generated and transmitted into space like TV signals transmit from Earth. I know, Linda, this information is factual because I help develop the onboard instruments. Within my inner circle, I know there is way more going on with TRAPPIST-1 solar system than is being admitted. A friend at Boeing told me that TRAPPIST-1, quote, has been officially added to the official target list for the Webb telescope, but confidentially, we already know that TRAPPIST-1 definitely has two planets that have intelligent life. In fact, both the USS Hoyt Vandenberg Starship and the USS Roscoe Hillenketter Starship are on station in the TRAPPIST-1 system and will remain there for several months, close quote. Linda, this is very significant because there has never been a time before that JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command, has put those two deep quantum tunneling starships in one solar system at the same time. That means TRAPPIST-1 is very special. The beauty of this Webb telescope is the fact that the downlink is managed by 23 different agencies from 16 countries with shared servers and are fully integrated simultaneously. Everyone will have access to the data as it comes in on the downlink at the same moment it arrives. There are written protocols in place for the announcement of evidence of life including high-level civilization findings, close quote. He means there should be international sharing of all Webb telescope data, but already this February 27, 2023 headline showed up four weeks ago in Mysterious Universe, quote, rumors of a cover-up that life signatures in TRAPPIST-1 star system were found by James Webb telescope, close quote meaning they already know this information. The aerospace source told me that he and so many others are frustrated by having to be sworn to secrecy about truth, the big truth that UFO UAPs are technologies from other advanced life in this universe, and that our government's own secret space force collaboration with the tall whites and some Nordics and some grays, helps keep humanity protected in a universe that ranges from friendly to neutral to hostile. The profession with prob probably the largest number of people sworn to secrecy about UFOs and ETs is the US military. I have interviewed so many people who graduated from high school sometime after World War II signed up to serve in a branch of American military, became an eyewitness to extraordinary lights, craft, and beams in the sky over sensitive military bases, and especially in the 1960s and 1970s, 
over nuclear bombs and tactical missiles in weapons storage areas. One of those young Americans began his military career right after high school graduation with the U.S. Air Force and retired 20 years later as a staff sergeant. He got his orders in 1978 to travel from his home in California 7,000 miles west across the Pacific Ocean to the island of Guam, famous during the Vietnam War. The island is a strategically important land base on a map of Japan, the Koreas, China, Philippines, Indonesia, and Australia. By the fall of 1979, Terry was working security police night shifts. I have seen several of his positive military records, but he is still worried today at age 64 because he raised his right hand to swear he would never talk about the UFO he and others saw over the Anderson Air Force Base weapons storage area. He has asked me to protect his identity, and I will simply call him Terry. It was October 17, 1979. Some dates you don't forget. I was an airman, E2. I was on a patrol with a sergeant on base, graveyard shift. 2.30 in the morning when we heard radio traffic from another patrol unit on base about some suspicious lights over what we called our WSA, which is our weapons storage area. Weapons storage area consists of maybe 20 or 30 bunkers that have bombs inside them, but on Anderson Air Force Base, we have nuclear weapons as well. And those nuclear weapons are uploaded into four B-52 bomber alert area. And this is all over in the same area where we saw these lights near the WSA. And so we start looking. We're about maybe two, three miles away on the opposite side of the base. But we could clearly see three amber lights in a row. They're not blinking over the runways of the WSA. I turn to my sergeant. And I says, sir, are those splitters? He says, no, there's nothing going on over there. So because the gate to the WSA was in our patrol zone, my sergeant would activate the lights and turn on the siren without telling our desk sergeant. He just decided this on his own because it, he had made mention that it could be an aircraft crashing. And as we approached the WSA, we have a clear field of vision. And we watched these lights for approximately a minute and a half, maybe two minutes to get there. These lights dimmed and just disappeared. So we made contact with the security police officer that's inside the WSA because that was his patrol zone. He didn't see anything because he was in his truck, and this was above him about 500 feet, and he was facing the opposite direction. And these were three amber lights in a straight line, approximately at what altitude above you? 500 feet. Very low, really. Yes, ma'am. And especially over in Air Force Base, because we would consider that a base incursion, although we handled it as a suspicious light. We weren't sure what we were looking at, but our flight chief, did hear the radio track, but he came out there as well, and we discussed what we saw. And that when they disappeared, was it a slow fade out or was it a blink out? It was like a dimmer switch. It was like the closer we got to that area, the dimmer the lights became until they were just blacked out. If you were comparing the color of the amber of these three lights, what would be an object we all might know? It would be a cross between an orange and yellow. You know, being in the Air Force and seeing planes all the time, I had never seen that color light. Were the lights round? Yes. So we went to make contact with the guard who was sitting at the gate in his truck. At this point, the third law enforcement security police vehicle that arrived was our flight chief. He's a master sergeant, 
And he's like, what's going on up here? We told him what we saw, and he says, well, I thought I saw something too, but I wasn't sure because I was behind the tree line in the housing area. Six o'clock in the morning, what we do is we go to our armory, and we unload our weapons, and we turn our weapons in and turn our rounds in. And our captain, who was never there, was there. And she pulls all of us aside and said, we need to talk to you guys. So we followed her over to our squadron headquarters where there were two guys there that were colonels, full bird colonels. One of them was our base commander. The other guy I'd never seen before. I don't know who he was. And so they separated us and asked each of our stories. We had the same story. They got us all together in the conference room and said, well, You didn't see anything. There was nothing there. There's no record. There's no anything like this. You know, sometimes uh, you could go island happy and see things that aren't there. And we're kind of looking at each other going, okay, this is, I, I see what they're trying to do. They're trying to convince us that nothing was there. And so we were sworn. We had to raise our right hand, sworn to secrecy that we would not talk to anybody about this incident because obviously it's something that they have no idea what it is. It's over a SAC base that has nuclear weapons. But Linda, I have to tell you that later on, when I got to my next base, I had heard that UFOs were occurring over strategic air command bases, particularly ones that had nuclear weapons. In 1979. Yes, ma'am. And when you get that briefing in the morning after 6 a.m., and they're saying you didn't see anything, and they make you raise your hand to swear secrecy, did it go through your mind, we're talking about three round amber lights in the sky last night, and they're going to this length to make us swear that we didn't see anything? Why are we swearing to something that we didn't see? Well, if you saw three round lights, that doesn't seem like a major threat. And I would appreciate if you could explain where you guys began to learn more information that could justify why they were making you swear to secrecy over three amber lights. That's the problem, is that why are we going through all of this? Why are we going through this debriefing? It was an unidentified object over our base as law enforcement specialists and security police, because security police has two different branches, uh, security police that guard the bombs and the planes, and then law enforcement specialists do the patrol. This is our job to make sure that our bombs and the planes are safe and secure. This was something we couldn't identify. Now they're telling us we didn't see anything, or maybe we're all island happy which was something weird because they said those words. Hmm. So why are we going through great lengths if you're telling us that there was nothing there, that there was no there there? Right. You know, never understood it because there was something there. We would not have reacted the way that we did. Our flight chief even admitted that he saw something. We had five SPs, including myself, that did see something that felt it was necessary to respond to that was over our base. Right. So I did run into a a buddy that worked in the control tower, and he was working that night. I just wanted to write out answer. He says, you know, I can't tell you even if there was. That is extraordinary that you would call somebody working in the control tower. You were a member of the security police. You are an eyewitness to these three amber lights that you now have been warned about, sworn in, you didn't see anything, and you would call the control room as a backup reality check, and he seems to be stonewalling as well. Right, and that was widely known. Linda, if air traffic controllers and pilots back then reported something, their jobs are on the line. So I wasn't surprised. What a disabling philosophy for people working in our military to be in a context that 
anything in the sky needs to be denied one way or another. Right. And doing years of research, the Guam has a history of UFO sightings as recently as this year. And it goes back to what I've always thought, and that is bases that have weapons of mass destruction like nuclear weapons were being trolled upon, and they still are. Look what happened to the missile silos. Right. In the 60s, our Minuteman missile sites were visited by UFOs and dramatic shutdowns, missile by missile by missile, that Robert Salas was in the underground control room and was aware that this was happening. And then Boeing came in to investigate and said it was not possible. What they explained, missile down every second for 10 seconds and 10 of the nukes, he and the engineering, they knew how they had built the Minuteman missile site, and it would be impossible. Right, and that's because Boeing was told to say that. By whom? Well, I would just say government officials, higher up, Air Force, I don't know. But Boeing had a contract to lose if they didn't cooperate. Do you remember specifically in a period of time after that of talking with maybe even superior officers, but at least some of the people in security and law enforcement who had also seen other lights, craft, structures in the sky where they said, we know that there are UFOs? The answer to that is no, but that did not keep us that were involved from talking to each other behind closed doors because we were new in the Air Force. Some of us were like me. I didn't want to jeopardize my career by taking an oath and then all of a sudden, you know, you're caught talking to the wrong person and you're court-martialed. So many dramas around UFOs have taken place in military contexts and people end up being told, you cannot talk about this We are swearing you in an oath. You will not talk about this. Creating artificial reality. Reality is classified, is what they have done. And in this classified reality, you and how many other thousands of people in American military know what they have seen, know that UFOs are one of the most sensitive subjects And that everybody is told not to talk about it, to keep it away from the public. Meanwhile, all of these military people know that reality is classified, and they know that the real reality is we're not alone in this universe, and that other intelligences from someplace else are interacting with our planet now and have been for probably millions of years. Absolutely. You know, how long is this going to go on? My big question is, and I did talk to Stan Freeman personally, face-to-face, about this years ago. I kept asking Stan, what did I see? What did I see? And I just want an answer of what I saw. And he says, well, I could tell you what you didn't see. And I'm like, what's that? And he says, you didn't see anything that we have. My UFO UAP whistleblower files continue to expand with more firsthand information from people in aerospace, military, science, and medicine. So come see me for the latest whistleblower updates that I have and that I will be sharing at Contact in the Desert the first weekend in June 2 to 4 at the Indian Wells California Renaissance Resort. And you can get tickets at contactinthedesert.com, and at the upcoming Portal to Ascension conference in San Diego on April 21st to 23rd. That's the same weekend that an aerospace source told me last year that the Pentagon had plans to use the Webb telescope to announce that a biological signature has been confirmed in an exoplanet's atmosphere. And you can get tickets for the San Diego Conference at Ascension Conf, C-O-N-F, A-S-C-E-N-S-I-O-N-C-O-N-F, dot com forward slash tickets.
And Ian, I am so interested, along with my pal Chocolate here, to learn what our listeners uh, tonight, what their reactions and what some probably are military and have similar stories to contribute to what Terry shared with us tonight. And, uh, and by my reckoning, this is the third time that we featured this year, in fact, in just over a month, right. uh, military whistleblowers coming forward to Earth Files and sharing their experiences. That's right. And it. I hope more and more, because if the government has continuing with policies of denial and even now messing around with uh, what they're going to do or not do with the Webb Telescope and Trappist, uh, it's really... I think it's depressing to learn that there may uh, be now other news. It, it's spreading that they are, have a cover-up. Why, why, why do they continue to persist with cover-ups when what we need on this planet more than ever is hard truth? Well, the audience are on your side here, Linda, and I'm with you as well, that we are ready for the truth and we need the truth. And we need the whistleblowers to keep coming forwards and uh, giving us the information that they know and that they've experienced. Yes. And for those of you who have had a military or an intel or an aerospace or medicine or science background, and you know quite a bit about what we're talking about and beyond that, into the truth of other intelligences and advanced technologies. Uh, I would greatly appreciate hearing from you. I feel in some ways that uh, there has never been a more critical time on planet Earth than to tell the truth and that maybe getting this truth out might begin to neutralize some of the war drums that seem to be accelerating toward some people wanting there to be a nuclear war. It's insane, it seems to me, what's happening. And maybe if we started getting a lot more truth about other intelligences, maybe the planet would go in another direction. So Ian, what do we have in terms of questions and comments now? Well, Jason Oldham is in the chat tonight and says, did you contact any of the other people that were with Terry at all? You have their experiences. You, you have to understand that I am fortunate if I get a full contact with DD-214, with meritorious service, uh, all of that that I have with Terry and the other people. And uh, it would be wonderful if I could just show you all of the records, but there's too much information and I agree with people that unfortunately we're living in a time where for them to come forward and simply uh, talk in the public about what it was that they saw that was so classified that they were sworn to secrecy and they're afraid that violating an oath that the government of the United States would do something to them. Like we've got to get past this and that it's not easy. It's not easy for them it's not easy for me. This is not, if you knew, if you all knew how difficult it is to do what I am trying to bring to you each week, I think you, <laughs> you might start weeping. It is extremely difficult. These people can't just manufacture everything that we want. That, that, I, that's what I've been coping with for 43 years. So it's not easy. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that about the DD214s because we did have a question earlier from someone about checking the sources and we always check the sources. So thank yeah. you for bringing that forward, Linda. Yeah. Isn't it odd, Ian, and everybody here tonight, that we Americans, at least, in a government that is supposed to be of, by, and for the people, would end up in this century at this point, where people who served in military defending our country are so frightened that they would be punished for talking about other life in the universe, for talking about technology that is advanced beyond anything that humans could ever have done on their own, but that I understand the tall whites and the Nordics have helped 
the United States, who knows what they've done with other countries, but that they have helped us build these starships, the LeMay, the Helen Ketter, and the, uh, the, uh, the other one. And that w when you think about what is at the core of a nation, and a nation that has people that will go and defend us in war, but then they could be court-martialed because they talk about a craft or strange lights or beings or something that's not from here. When are we going to get past this? It's a, a kind of a national world insanity. I call it uh, reality is classified. But when you hear over and over, and I only am able to bring to you maybe one out of 10, because I do have strict rules for myself. I have to see their military records. And everybody is so afraid of some kind of retaliation. And we're not talking about keeping war secrets. We're talking about being honest that we're not alone in this universe, that it is from a lot of scientists and military people who talk, it is teeming with other consciousness, and that we're being kept in this bizarre, strange bubble. We're so far, no proof, no proof that there's other life in this universe. And that's not true. It's not true at all. And so we're living in a schizophrenic time that is unhealthy on the face of it by all of the lies as policies. So, Ian, it's not easy to do these. No, uh, enlightened executive in the chat says, please send whistleblowers to testify at appropriate congressional committees. Oh, I'd be delighted, but some of them probably would like to go. Uh, and I have talked with some people who are supposed to have last year been involved in the congressional hearing. Did you watch that congressional hearing, so-called? Those people from the Pentagon, they weren't even serious. They were pretending like they knew nothing even about uh, what had happened in uh, the Minuteman missile silos and other things. I mean, it, it, was, it was farcical. So... When are we going to stop theater? Theatrics. Well, Linda, we've got a, a message here that says, um, do you think the government is withholding truth to protect the technology and control this knowledge uh, or that it brings? Or could we be forbidden to divulge the truth by the higher intelligences? I don't know. Both could be at work. But there's just something fundamental to what I have learned in 81 cycles around the sun. If consciousness, if your brain, your heart, your soul are always trying to stay in the frequency of telling the truth and agape love, that that is the frequency that I think that this universe and the thought that dwells in the light wants. And when, if you end up on a planet in which for a century or more, if you go back to the Anunnaki, was there ever any real honesty with the newly genetically manipulated DNA in already evolving primates, Cro-Magnon, Homo sapiens, sapien? Was there ever, ever any straightforward honesty between the makers of humanity as the, one of the most recent humanoid experiments and those advanced ET intelligences that were responsible for manipulation of DNA in already evolving primates. Has there ever been any honesty? We're at such a bizarre point right now. The whole earth just seems like it's schizophrenic in every direction. And if all these years, if for 45,000 years, going back to the crossfade with Neanderthalensis and cro Homo sapiens, if we had evolved with honesty with those that made us, if we had been in on whatever the goal was, which might have been actually to have souls that would evolve and be tested between the light and the dark, 
with beings that were trying to see if they could make a species from a lowly primate on this planet and that it would evolve and that they could prove to a council of the universe, we can show you we have taken a lowly primate and we have manipulated DNA in already evolving primates on this watery planet Earth. And look at what we have been able to produce. Maybe that's one of the equations. That is in my uh, fourth book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness. That is the 106-page chapter that I've referenced so many times of people who have either seen themselves inside of the preservation tubes or they have seen humans they recognize as if waiting to go into the tubes and that the theme is that the people in in my chapter uh, on this particular subject all of them every one of them had the sense that this was a demonstration by one intelligence having to do with some big issue with others. Being able to manipulate and create conscious biological lives and be able to sustain them in an artificial way in order to have some kind of a regular recycling in which consciousness and perhaps the soul light itself could be put into container bodies to be held for some reason that's not clear, but that in the end, as is described in the uh, book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, in that chapter, there is this, when, when you finish it all, you have this feeling or this sense of beings that are trying to do something extraordinary and that they have been interacting on this planet for a very long time, some fighting each other, some fighting each other over these genetic experiments by advanced intelligences. And in fact, this is from Glimpses, Volume 2. And it was me trying to sum up, this was at the, toward the end in my own book, Quote, perhaps the unique isolation that each human feels and the peculiar melancholy that a dark sky filled with stars can evoke have something to do with knowledge buried in our genes and our souls, a sensing of ancient intimacies with other beings and other worlds. And now in this time of revolution, when the whole world will know we are not alone in this universe, our greatest challenge as a species will be to stand up unafraid before the old lords and watchers. Ultimately, there is a common bond among all life forms ebbing and flowing on spirals of different frequencies supported by a singular force, an invisible matrix of energy from which everything emerges and to which everything returns. And from the bottom of my heart and soul to all of you, I truly feel that is the big picture. Ian. Hey, Linda, Sarah Guest is in the chat and she says, please ask Linda, what types of ETs might be living on the tra Trappist planets? Uh, it was, uh, a year ago, in the summer of 2022, that Buddy Bolton, the remote viewer in New York City who has done so much work with intelligence agencies in the United States government on a lot of things related to UFOs and ETs, we did, a, I think it was two reports on my Earth Files YouTube channel. And what is so interesting is that he was identifying in the same area, those two middle planets, so much like Earth, that there were beings that lived in and out of water. And 
That has come up before in several interviews that I have done with people in Australia and New Zealand, where they have had some kind of interaction with what would fall into the category of tall whites. I'm not saying, not saying red lights, I'm not saying that there are tall whites in the middle planets at Trappist-1. What I'm getting across is people in the abduction syndrome, no matter what, with who, in what solar system, you will have people who talk about being on a planet where the beings that seem to be somehow involved with the superstructures and craft go in and out of water. Doesn't mean that they don't go on land, it just means that they do, they have some kind of a complementary lifestyle that involves water and that they can have cities. That has come in interviews that I've done with people who have been in Australia and New Zealand. So we are looking at everything through the lens of Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien that has been kept dumb and blind by policies of lies and denials in the current round since World War II. And before that, you can keep going back and get back as far as the Anunnaki. I think the Anunnaki were full-blood ETs. Whether they're on a planet that they operate like a spaceship, meaning they can move it, they can move it around, I have no idea, but that would have been Nebiru. And now we have uh, information coming from the University of Southern California, where they have had perturbations in objects out between the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt. And they're now looking, trying to look in infrared with the Keck uh, telescope and others, trying to see if they can see the shape of what appears to be a mass out there. And there are some speculations. Could this be what the Anunnaki stone texts talked about the Anunnaki so-called gods of Enki and Enlil coming through this solar system every 3,600 years and causing chaos. Well, I don't know. And I know that the astronomers at the University of Southern California who are trying to find out what is out there, they're very sensitive. They, they don't want to be involved in uh, what they think are Fantascaboria <laughs> discussions. Um, but the Anunnaki are recorded in all of this limestone in Mesopotamia. And there are authors who have written very interesting books in the last 10 years having to do with translations in this issue of some kind of a humanoid species that dominated for some period of time. Anu was their upper god, and Anu Naki is what they were called. And where did they go? I mean, there are sections in translations which make it sound like they did something that caused the sky to be on fire and we would interpret it as perhaps nuclear warfare. And there is Trinitite, the glassy silicon that we found down in White Sands after uh, the, uh, 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 it was uh, July 16th, 1945, we did the Trinity test. And silicon sand, where the atomic bomb test was, turn to this strange green trinitite, and they have found strange green trinitite in the Sahara Desert, in parts of India, and in that part of the world. What is the true history of ETs in this solar system on this planet? What is the true extraterrestrial intelligence history? Well, right now, I sure hope that somebody tells us the truth in that third week of April, just once to go on the record with information that has leaked 
and not say, oh, well, we can't tell the world anything now because we had leaks and they'll expect and we can't do anything that anybody ever expects. We have to do everything that no one expects. That seems to be sort of the theme inside of governments. So all I can put on the record is that I have talked with so many professional people of which only a tiny percentage will ever talk, either in audio or video, about something so fundamental as the question, are humans the only intelligent life in this universe of three trillion suns? The answer from everybody I've ever talked to is, of course not. So why don't you tell the world the truth? Because I've heard this because we can't threaten the development of our technologies. So what does it take to tell the truth? What do you guys think? Linda, let's go do the super chats and uh, we'll come back to the audience and see what they think of okay. that. So ask, ask the audience anything and they can post it in the chat this evening. All right. That'll be great. Okay, we've got uh, super chats this evening from Moonbird, Hi, Forest Moonbird. Lady, Jason Odom, Terry D, Vicky, Rebecca Cold, Yin Yang Glow, Whisper of Love, Sick of the BS, and Northern Lights. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I would like to know uh, what people are thinking about my question. What does it take to tell the truth on planet Earth, that we're not alone in this universe and it is teeming with other consciousness. And why shouldn't we know that? Well, let's uh, put, the, put that out to the audience and, and see. We've got a lot of uh, people in from, from, well, from all over the world again this evening. Good. We've got people in from the UK. Uh, Diggers Journals here from Ireland, along with several other people from Ireland, Chile, Bahamas, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil. Um, Sinoski is in Machu Picchu, Peru. Wow. Serbia, Ghana, India, and Canada. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. And one of the most beautiful places that I have ever been, spent uh, three or four days and climbed Wahini, was Machu Picchu, this magical, incredible place. And it was one of those um, experiences that probably a lot of you have had when you go to a place that seems to be powered and packed full of something in which other intelligences have been focused, like Machu Picchu at some point, I had, uh, at that time, I was doing a lot of deep, deep meditation where you don't feel your body or anything. You're just focused on a communication somehow with deep consciousness. And I got to uh, Machu Picchu, I had uh, climbed Wahini up to the top. I ended up being the only female sitting up there on those rocks on the top of Wahini, the only female, and there were something, I remember it was 23 men and me sitting up on top of the peak that you see in the photos. And I, when I came back down, I wanted to do the, what I consider to be when you're in deep meditation. It is like a, a handshake with the universe somehow. And uh, I sat purposely having this experience of climbing through the little waterfalls and the gorgeous orchids and all this stuff up to Wahini and then just rocks. You just sit on rocks. It's not no, no trees, no grass, just sit on rocks. And then you come back down through the beautiful mountain, and I was at another place, at Machu Picchu, and uh, had decided I would sit on rock again. And I, uh, it, I've often thought of this, like uh, the thought that dwells in the light to dwell in me and strengthen me, and I was doing some kind of a meditation like that, and all of a sudden came this uh, magenta, 
it was magenta. To say it was a flame is not quite right, but it was wafting. And after, it was only until after the Peru trip, I had never run into any communication about magenta in a meditation coming in, some people say like a flame. To me, it was, it was sort of undulating, but I don't know, soft somehow. And that when you would have that experience of the magenta frequency in the frequencies of meditation, it might move you on further with more strength and, more, and thus more courage. And I've always thought about that linking into everything in life, that we have to reach out to frequencies in the universe around us in order to strengthen our frequencies as an individual conscious being. I think that is a fundamental truth. Go ahead, Ian. I think that's so important too. I've meditated on the uh, earthworks and famous places in Wiltshire and also yeah. your experience at Machu Picchu reminded me of when I was in, in Mexico. I, after, soon after I'd visited uh, UFO abductee Carlos Diaz's house in Tepotzlan, I went to the Temple of Tepotzteco and dangled my feet over the edge of the uh, ravine watching the condors below. But it Everyone should take a chance to visit those places yeah. if they have an opportunity to, to feel the energies and also to, uh, to try and connect as well. Yeah, when I was at Saxal Oman, I, I had a powerful meditation uh, on, a, on a rock amid all of those big rocks. Um, and th there were other places that I went where they're not even necessarily on maps or in books. But you will be out in, let's say, some high part of the mountain coming up out of Cusco, uh, which I happened with friends. And you end up, you're looking, you can find that there are stones or places. It's as if somebody had the ability to melt granite, melt uh, basalt, melt rock, and refigure it into even having like places that water you could imagine running down. It is as if there is terraforming there that people don't even understand. Linda, you asked the, the audience's opinion. Uh, Maz Vassassin says, I can't understand the policy of denial when the truth is becoming more and more present. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely do I agree. Um, Steve uh, says, these orange orbs are shutting nukes off. I've witnessed one orange orb at the range of 18 feet above my head and two other witnesses for five minutes near Newport Naval Base, Newport, Rhode Island. Okay, uh, can you ask him to, if he, has he written? I would like to know more and share it with the audience tonight because that's very relevant to what I reported uh, with Terry. Uh, do you have the full yes. details? And here's the thing as well. Uh, other people had referenced the location. It's important to, to notice where Guam is from the first report. Guam being right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Right. Uh, people had said perhaps there's uh, um, aliens uh, who are using bases on Earth, maybe in the oceans, and that the oceans, you know, the underwater bases and cities, yes. says Hello Alley. And Santana Barish says we haven't even explored half of our oceans. Yeah, if you all had been here in, uh, we started the Earth Files YouTube channel about three and a half years ago. And there was a period of time when I was reporting a, uh, in a lot of detail about the Defense Intelligence Agency analyst who talked to me in December of 1999 about 23 years working as an analyst and he was retired and he sought me out through a World Bank person and he I think more than anything else it was seven hours conversation but the part that really stuck with me and it was so logical actually when I remember looking back at how I felt he went into how he knew about the different extraterrestrials who were in conflict over the planet. 
and some would like to go down beneath the basins of the oceans and seas, not like abyss, nothing on the base. No, going down through the basins of the oceans and the seas into very large caverns. That this is what the Nordics uh, like to do. They, they had the cover of all the water of this planet as a layer above wherever they went in to base themselves. And that the greys liked going into mountains and they liked to be in high mountains. And that the, uh, that particular man was dividing the conflict into three groups, never talking about tall whites, even though he may have been thinking the third group were reptilians. And talked about how the reptilians have always been the ones in the hot, warm Mesopotamian deserts, but their choice of living has been underground as well. So all of a sudden, that's why uh, in three years ago and so forth, I kept referring to this like Hotel Earth, that you had different levels with different life forms all the way down, who knows how far. So I think that that is a very accurate context in which to think about planets. Mars could have a very active, present, uh, I'd not perhaps a civilization as we think of, but it could still have a lot of Earth life from whatever was left after the bombing uh, of, that John Brandenburg has written about could still be in the center of Mars. And I know that Ganymede has come up in several different discussions with me by people who know that Ganymede is used by the tall whites. They have a base inside of that big moon. And you, you go on and all of a sudden you start looking at all the other uh, solar systems, my star map that I bring in and out, and start realizing we just think about the surface of the Earth military operations. They think about how do, where do you go to have the best defensive, offensive positions? Well, apparently that's what extraterrestrials manipulating DNA and already evolving primates and in conflict with each other, including reptiles versus Nordics versus some form of greys, that has been a Ge geographical, sociological stasis on this earth for a very long time. And what a way you make the species that you want to experiment on and with, that's your surface life. But the people who are actually interacting with the surface life live inside of planets. And suddenly, a whole lot of things start making a lot more sense, including the fact that a lot of people noticed over the last several decades, because I've been, been in discussions, how many true UFO encounters and some of the best film have often been in or around oceans, beaches, lakes. So we have so much to learn, you guys. And for those of you who have had serious military backgrounds and you know what I'm reporting is factual and you have your own stories, please let me know. And Ian, uh, what about one more question from our audience? Well, I want to bring you the, uh, the reply from Steve, uh, who I think is ex-US uh, Marine retired. He says, uh, the orange orbs are very bright, no sound, Gravity has no effect on this orb. There is a lapse of time, and I was hypersensitive to everything for a week. So perhaps there's more to his experience than, uh, than, than we, we know at the moment. Oh, I thank you so much for giving that so Ian could read that. Um, and if it is possible, if you're comfortable in uh, either commenting with Ian, but what I need is your an email from you to me at earthfiles at earthfiles.com so that I can then set up uh, communication with you. We can work in proton mail, which I think is encrypted. 
Um, and, and so let's see if we can put uh, a meeting of minds here together, Ian. That's right. If, if you could reach out to us, Steve, at earthfars at earthfars.com, or you can even contact me as well. Uh, I'm at ian at earthfars.com, and I'll put you in touch with Linda. But let's hear more, please. Yes. Thank you. Anybody with a, one last good question? Yeah, well, we've got some comments here. Um, Merch says, could it be, Linda, that if the world was told about intelligent life elsewhere in the Trappist system, etc., that peace would break out in the world, and we would stop our infighting with our fellow humans. And one last comment as well from that UFO chat, yes. who's also in the chat <laughs> this evening. I wish I knew what it would take, Linda. I hope it will be shared in our lifetime for us all to advance the future of our Earth, learn more about where we originate and what other life shares with the stars. And the importance of our souls and what is happening with so much violence on this planet. I don't know about you guys, but when I turned on the television for the Tennessee shooting of the three eight or nine year olds and those three adults, I just suddenly started crying. I stood in front of the TV news just crying, crying, crying. It was for the three children, the three adults, for all the children, for all the adults. Humans were not originally made for war, for hatred, for killing. I know that. I feel that. We were made for the agape love that the Greeks talked about, beings that had souls that could help each other, could feel each other, intuit each other, interact with each other without killing. How have we reached a point I heard on news crying that there were thir have been 33 school shootings in this year alone and we're only at March 29th. How is this possible? Something fundamental, you guys, has to change. We are living in a world that lies are being sold for trillions of dollars. And truths are being disparaged so that the control of the planet is going to be with a tiny, tiny, tiny little group. And they would like to see the rest of us kill each other, be, would reduce population. It's insane. It's insane what's happening. And if you all who come to Earth Files YouTube channel can talk with people that you know about how important it is to look at what is happening in terms of people coming forward to tell the truth about their interactions, military or aerospace or science or medicine or abductees with other intelligences. And we have to get to a place where everybody is telling the truth. Look at what world leaders go through. I mean, is anybody talking about the truth there? I think the earth could survive and be wonderful if we were back in a context of frequency, just like being in Peru and climbing that mountain and seeing that magenta flame or undulation. If everybody were on the same frequency from the heart and the mind and the soul of being to being, I don't see how anybody could kill anybody else. And on that note, Ian, I'm going to say I'm giving you all a big hug. I have to get ready to go on an airplane tomorrow to go to the Parapod conference. And that Ian will be interfacing with your questions and your comments. And that I will look forward to being back next week to see what is there and to do and keep doing these live shows with whatever is the most important information that I can bring to you in any given week with the deep hope that the government of the United States of America, originally conceived of and for and by the people, will be the one that stands up to the plate and makes the announcement with proof we are not alone in this universe. 
and the Trappist solar system has other intelligence and it's only one of hundreds. 168 civilizations are supposed to be at this end of the Milky Way galaxy known to our government. Let's join that universe of life and consciousness and let's stop trying to kill humans on this planet. I love you guys. See you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. Select a language Bind them anywhere. They love and the captions will now appear in that language. Sort of gone through and they will hold their heads. I never had a cat do that before. And they'll pull against the comb, helping me get out snarls. And I think it's the best they've ever been.